scientist, um, but do a lot of work in healthcare. So my presentation is going to be a little bit different than uh, some of the other presentations that have come before me. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, looking at how we can think about mobile phones for healthcare. And so by the end of this presentation, hopefully you'll have a very different perspective on the phone that's probably in front of you right now in your pocket or your purse. Um, so if you think about technology and healthcare, if, if you look at some major paradigm shifts in healthcare, uh, you can think about one particular one, like pork, uh, of point of care diagnostics, the ability to have a piece of technology that can diagnose disease at the time that you have a patient coming into a clinic. And so this is an ultrasound machine from a few, uh, quite a quite a time back. In fact, the computational power in an ultrasound machine like this was in the phone just 10 years ago, so, or 10 years ago. So if you can imagine a modern phone with the amount of horsepower that you have in this thing. And so if you think about these uh, paradigm shifts in diagnostics and screening, you know, point of care was one of the major ones. Now we're in a major paradigm shift when it comes to screening. We're in a, we're in a paradigm shift where phones are going to be at the center of a lot of the things that we're looking at. And here's an example of a pulse oximeter that's basically a device that just connects to a microphone jack on a phone where it uses as a data port to basically do um, ambulatory uh, pulse oximetry, so something that an individual can do at home. If you think about uh, the most ubiquitous computing platform out there, it's really the mobile phone. Um, right now, there's, what, 8 billion people in the world? There's 6 billion phones in the world. Just in three years from now, there are going to be more phones than people in the world. And if you think about this as a ubiquitous platform, think about the affinity that people have to this thing. If you forget the phone, you'll probably go back home to go get this thing. And so in terms of compliance and technology and, and screening, and if you think about ways to infuse technology into one's life and you have to embed healthcare into it, this is one particular way of thinking about as a dissemination tool. On top of that, we're in this other paradigm shift in terms of wearables. So these are a plethora of things that I've used and worn in my, in my career. And there's everything from smart shoes to spirometers to life vests that, that basically monitor vital signs continuously. So these are just these notion, this notion of being able to continuously monitor vitals and what you can do with that data is still uh, left. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how, what to do with it. But there's these technologies that are, are, that are being deployed that can give you these uh, uh, physiological signals in, in more continuous fashion. Um, just, um, just a few years back, TedMed had this uh, conference that they did where they were looking at you know, the future of the smartphone. So it's hard to see, but this was our former um, sec uh, Surgeon General uh, where she was actually being, uh, she was using a lot of these phone apps that were actually monitoring her vitals. So this is demonstrated with just a few of these phone apps and a few attachments to a phone, you could do a full physical. And so this was just an example just four years back that you could already do this. And now there are a, a plethora of these technologies out there that connect to a phone. So one of the opportunities with mobile phones, as I alluded to, is that the affinity that people already have to the phone and the penetration that you have phones in terms of a global health, from a global health and uh, global access standpoint, is if you can leverage the phone, you have these opportunities to do things like chronic disease management more effectively where you know, the, uh, the compliance rates are pretty low because people either not have the technology or might have easy access to it, but also thinking about new ways to create screening tools. So if you have access to a large population, in fact, pretty much the entire world that has access to a phone, what could you do there? And also that has some implications for population health. And obviously, this has some new opportunities for looking at how we can capture new phenotypes and being able to correlate that to some of the uh, genomics works that's also happening. So you have this opportunity for new discoveries and diagnostics and identifying new biomarkers, which is what my group does with mobile phones themselves. So one of the areas that we focus on and the motivation for this work is really continuous measurements. If you have a phone that's able to capture biomarkers and signals over long periods of time, albeit noisy, uh, if you have that continuous signal, what can you do with that? You know, the whole, you know, one of the holy grails of being able to, con uh, to uh, identify disease early is if you had signal uh, pretty much uh, in real time or continuously. But it's really hard to imagine wearing all those sensors that I showed you previously, but how far can a phone take you in terms of being able to capture some of these biomarkers? So traditionally, the way the phone, as people have looked at it, is that it's a data collection source. So here's just a simple use case, which has been effective, of basically an app that helps you capture kind of caloric intake. You know, what have I eaten? I'll take a picture of what I've eaten and kind of guesses at what it is. Um, the phone kind of knows where you've gone, so you can try to figure out what restaurants you've gone to and those kinds of things, where you can start to fill out what you've had uh, to eat. And so that's one end of collect, kind of caloric intake. And expenditure could actually be tracked by just the accelerometer on the phone, if you have it with you. So that's like the simplest example example of kind of where we are today, where you have patient-reported outcomes and diaries that you can do with the phone. 
What I've been looking at with my group has said, well, let's take a step back. The phone, the modern phone is actually um, uh, chock full of a lot of sensors. In fact, these sensors in here, we often take for granted. You know, we often, you know, think about playing, you know, Pokemon Go, Angry Birds, and these kind of games on these things where you have all these sensors that are designed towards that. Like the little sensor in there that just detects if uh, the phone's tilted and goes from portage to landscape mode. It's actually a pretty powerful gyro and accelerometer. Um, the cameras are just mind-bogglingly good these days, right? They can rival an SLR camera. In fact, there's one on the front and back these days. Even some phones have two on the back. Um, capacitive touch, uh, microphones, multiple microphone speakers. Um, so we often take this for granted in, for, in terms of just using it for uh, gaming or telephony. But what we've done is kind of push the envelope a bit and, and really push the boundaries in terms of what you can do with these sensors. In fact, there's a ton of wireless uh, uh, um, sensors in there as well, like for you know, GSM and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And so my group has been looking at is how do we use existing sensors on mobile phones for health sensing? Um, so how do we use the microphone and speaker for physiological assessment? How do we use the camera for non-invasive blood sensing? How do we use different sensors on the phone to be able to uh, figure out how do we actually enable screening and diagnosis for, for global health? So um, this is just some examples that we've been uh, working on. And I'll give you uh, kind of a, sneak, uh, a, a, a little bit more information about some of these things as we go along. Uh, in the pulmonary space, we've been looking at how do we use the microphone for pulmonary assessment. So you, turning a phone into a spirometer. Um, cough analysis, in particular, how can you use cough analysis for tuberculosis just by using um, uh, microphones. Blood screening, so non-invasive blood screening by using the camera and flash in a unique way to identify how much hemoglobin is in the blood, bilirubin in a baby, again, without pulling blood out of the body, um, cardiovascular diseases, so looking at how do you do SpO2 monitoring and, and a couple other things. Um, even disease-specific use cases, using the speaker and microphone to get your heart rate and respiratory rate when the, when the phone is next to your bedside table so you can do things like sleep sensing and sleep apnea, um, and even osteoporosis where you can use the gyro and the accelerometer to figure out uh, bone resonances in your bone by just using a, a commodity phone. So there's a whole plethora of things that we've worked on, and I'll just kind of dive into a bit, bit, uh, some of these projects to kind of uh, spur some inspiration in terms of looking at if you had a ubiquitous device where you can capture these phenotypes, what could you do with your own research if you combined it with some of these capture capabilities? Um, so some of the earlier work that we looked at was uh, measuring lung function. So if you think about uh, you know, COPD or asthma or most lung uh, ailments outside the United States, you know, those uh, conditions are actually one of the, some of the leading cause of death outside of the, uh, the U.S. Even in the U.S., this is usually three or four, depending on uh, um, you know, uh, what statistics you look at. But one of the mainstays for respiratory assessment is spirometry. So this is a clinical device on the left. You have a more expensive device in the middle. And then you have a home spirometer on the far right. Uh, the one on the far right you might only give you a few pieces of information. So a lot of times pulmonologists don't really rely on that. So you really want a full uh, lung assessment um, either using one of the devices on the left. But if you think about managing you know, COPD or asthma, before you have a pulmonary exacerbation, you want to be able to figure out how you can get ahead of that. And so monitoring lung function continuously or at least lung, lung function more periodically is something that could actually enable diagnosis and screening before somebody gets to an exacerbation. Um, so the idea is like how do you build these home devices? Uh, home spirometer, you might not have it with you. They're kind of clunky and... and um, and compliance actually is one of the issues. So what we did was we actually built one of the first uh, mobile phone apps that uses the microphone to actually do full spirometry. So the way it works is you take the phone, it has a camera on the front, so it kind of knows how far you're holding the phone from your face, and then you do an open mouth technique where you do a full uh, expiratory maneuver where you actually blow at the face of the phone with your mouth open, and it actually uses, uh, we actually use a machine learning algorithm and from the microphone data to actually figure out your um, uh, flow, uh, the flow volume curve of the actual maneuver at that point. So it's very similar to what you would do with a clinical spirometer like on the left here, but you don't need a mouthpiece. In fact, you can use any commodity microphone to do it. Um, and so, um, so basically the way it works is that there's a visualization on the phone and it tells you if you're blowing hard enough, if you're, like, if you're not blowing hard enough, the, the visualization says you need to blow harder and blow harder. So there's actually biofeedback bio that actually encourages the person to actually do a proper technique. If the technique is incorrect, it gives you feedback in real time as well. So the way it works is, uh, you know, traditional spirometers basically try to get an amount of flow volume over a certain amount of time. So you have clinical spirometers that use a turbine or a pneumatac. Um, in our case, um, we don't have that. 
And so what we did was we actually modeled the entire uh, uh, vocal tract system of, a human, of the human body and turned this into a computer science problem. Basically said, look, when somebody's blowing out of the face of the, when they're blowing out and they're, you're capturing that particular signal, um, you can actually use the amount of the airflow that's coming out and the obstruction and restriction you can actually hear at the other end. And what happens is the resonant frequency actually changes if you have higher and higher, or higher and higher amounts of um, obstruction and restriction. So we essentially turned the vocal tract into a flow sensor. Um, and this technique actually came out of speech processing te uh, technology. So when, speech, when you have speech processing, the vocal tracts that are activated in that noise that you typically hear, uh, researchers have for years have tried to cancel that out to make it easier to detect when you say, you know, okay, Google or Alexa. It makes it easier to identify those trigger words, but it turns out that noise signal is actually proportional to the amount of flow coming out of your vocal, or of your air, air system. And so that's how we did this. We turned the uh, computer science uh, uh, speech recognition problem on its head a little bit and looked at that noise source, which was something that people have been trying to cancel out for years. So we did, uh, we actually take, took this work a bit further and developed an, uh, an app that basically uses, um, uh, that isn't an app on a smartphone, but uses any commodity phone that's a feature phone. And we, we developed an infrastructure where the algorithm, instead of being on the phone, is actually on a server somewhere. So you can dial a 1-800 number from anywhere in the world and, and actually listen to kind of the prompts, and you can actually do this on any phone, including a landline or a payphone. Um, we modeled the transfer function from going from a phone over the air to the cellular network, and, and then really trying to figure out what happens to that sound. And so this is an example of basically doing a PFT, a pulmonary function test, um, using um, an old um, feature phone. Um, and so on the bottom right is an example of clinics that use our tool, that's been using our tools to basically do pulmonary function tests at a massive scale where you can use any ordinary phone, literally turning billions of phones into a health screening tool. So when we, we did a very large clinical trial, uh, we actually looked at 10,000 patients where they had a paired clinical uh, uh, gold standard test from a uh, pulmonary from a pulmonary clinic and our tool, uh, we actually are within the ATS guidelines of what you typically would see error for spirometry. Um, in fact, this is something that we're, uh, it was within the bounds of what you would have. If you have a predicate device that's a similar device, uh, we're already within the error bounds of what the FDA would typically look at for a predicate device. So we're actually pushing some of this work forward to get clearance of it, clearance for this as well. The area that we started to focus on afterwards is looking at, you know, if we have, you know, this uh, ability to capture uh, audio signals and biosignals from the microphone, what could you do with coughs? So this was an area that we started to work with with the Gates Foundation, looking at could we use cough frequency as an indicator for the spread of TB? In particular, if you want to do an uh, uh, infection uh, study of infectivity of TB, could you use the cough counts as a proxy to figure out where uh, TB might be occurring? And also personalizing it for an individual so that if somebody's on treatment, if the cough counts go down, is that a way to know that that treatment's working, and if not, you can intervene sooner. That was what we started with. Um, and then our secondary hypothesis was, can we identify a healthy cough from a TB cough? All right, so I'll talk a little bit about how that works. So one of the things that we did was we took this spectral-based approach where we created an algorithm that essentially, from a, any noisy source, um, be it a microphone data or, or any other microphone, you can actually tease out when somebody's coughing. So you have throat clearing speech, you know, background noises, and with pretty high accuracy, our algorithms can actually identify coughing. So you can actually just use this to see if this is a particular signal that you can use for um, uh, how well somebody's doing or just in an environment like this to see if cough prevalence is an indicator for uh, the spread of certain diseases. Um, and so what we did was, working with the uh, Gates Foundation, we basically paired up with the Desmond Tutu Foundation in, uh, in South Africa to basically see if we can capture healthy coughs and TB coughs and have a you know, you know, sputum test and actual chest x-ray to actually make sure that they were infected and have active TB, could we use that audio signal that we're capturing to actually create an acoustical biomarker for TB, all right? Um, and that's what we did. So this on the, on the, on the uh, left is an example of a, the cough box that uh, where the data was being collected, where you have patients that go in there, the, the box is closed, there's an impactor in there that's actually capturing the particles that are aerosolized, so we know that there's actually TB in the air. There's a microphone in there, just a commodity microphone that you might find on a mobile phone, uh, to be able to pair those results together. The hypothesis was that when those granulomas actually form in the lungs, um, the air coming out of it when you cough, actually sounds different. If you ask a pulmonologist or a TB researcher, they're like, no, it actually doesn't. Well, um, well it, the part of that is because the human ear is not tuned to actually figure out those subtle changes in frequencies. But if you take a machine learning approach to this, you can actually tease apart the changes in the airflow as a real result of those granulomas that are formed in the, in the lungs. And so that was our hypothesis that we went into it. So, 
So um, just, to, um, just to summarize, uh, so our, our accuracy in terms of identifying coughs is very high. I mean, with 95% accuracy, our false positive rates are pretty low. Um, but the most, the most interesting thing that we've started to discover now is on the bottom, which I don't have the sensitivity specificity plot yet completely because we're still in the midst of, of, of analyzing our TB data. But right now, the early results show that with 82% sensitivity, 85% specificity, we can actually identify if you had, two indiv if you had individuals that were either healthy or had TB or, or, or pneumonia or some other kind of related uh, respiratory infection, um, that with that kind of sensitivity and specificity, we can identify just from the uh, cough itself. And just to put that in perspective, uh, gene expert sputum tests around that, because a lot of times you can't actually cough up that much sputum, or the sputum doesn't have enough of the viral load in it to get there. So this is an acoustical signature. So if you think about um, co-infectivity between HIV and TB, where those granulomas might not be seen on a chest x-ray, um, coughing might be another indicator that you can actually get ahead of something like that as well. Well, all right. So this is some of the first results uh, out there in terms of being able to use um, coughing as a particular indicator that if somebody's infected or not. Another area we looked at was leveraging the camera phone. So if you look at you know, the back of your phone, you've got a flash and a camera there. So how can we use that structured light and that light, lighting source with the camera to be able to do non-invasive blood screening? So hyperbilirubinemia was an area that we've also explored where if you take a picture of the sternum of a baby, could you actually just identify how much bilirubin is in the blood? Um, this one is actually an interesting one because as a case-finding tool for global health, we need to find the babies that are actually jaundiced. And in fact, not just jaundice, but how is their bilirubin tracking? Um, babies with dark pigments, they're actually harder to see if they're jaundice or not. They don't, just, they don't look yellow as light, lighter pigmented babies. So having a tool to be able to do this pretty effectively, community health workers, was a need that we were trying to address. Um, if you think about bilirubin, so bilirubin in the blood actually um, absorbs blue wavelengths of light. So what we said was, look, if you have the white flash on a camera phone, it's actually a pretty broad spectrum. So if we modeled the flash, and if we could look at how much light is being absorbed and reflected the different uh, uh, wavelengths of light, we can actually try to figure out what the, how much bilirubin is actually in the blood. You know, previous uh, computer science researchers have looked at basically um, looking at the RGB data and saying, oh, do I see yellow or not? But that actually doesn't work. A lot of babies don't look yellow. Um, and then your pigment, skin pigment, can also get goofed up there as well. So what we did was we actually looked at the flash, the white light that actually illuminates when you take that picture, and actually look at the absorption and reflection of that light uh, incident on the skin. So we did a study of uh, nearly 700 newborns in the United States uh, across the uh, across the country, uh, and with a, a, a makeup of, of uh, various uh, 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 racial for racial diversity, where we had um, skin tones that were represented in the entire population. And the TCB, the trans transcutaneous bilirubinometer, is a non-invasive device. Uh, Philips and Drager and a couple other uh, companies make that, where it's an optical approach where you put it on the forehead of the baby, and it actually um, does a non-invasive uh, bilirubin assessment. Uh, the BillCam app is actually works just as well as a TCB meter, and that correlation is to a blood draw, a trans uh, a serum bilirubin. So if you look at the blend altman plot, you can actually just use the BillyCam app, uh, just the, taking a picture of a baby um, as a screening tool. Um, basically, if you know uh, um, kind of what the guardrails are and the guard bands, you can actually escalate to basically doing a serum, total serum bilirubin or a blood draw. Um, but it turns out that the app is actually works just as well as a non-invasive uh, customized device. Um, we took this uh, another step further where we actually had a colleague that reached out to us and said, you know, if you could do jaundice in babies, could you do it in adults for pancreatic cancer or liver disease or other kinds of diseases? So what we started to do was we actually started to look at the sclera of the eye, the white parts of the eye. Uh, so these uh, uh, fancy glasses here are just some parts of the study that we did to basically try to see if from the phone, could we capture the sclera, the white part, and could we actually regress to the bilirubin level just by taking a picture of the sclera? So think about the implication of this. So if you look at a, a modern phone, when you unlock the phone, you look at it, right? So we, I, so we have a lot of images of your eyes by just looking at the phone. And over time, could you actually see the amount of bilirubin uh, increasing uh, for people that are at risk? And so the idea for this was, could we get ahead of things like pancreatic cancer or those kinds of things where we could start to see the amount of bilirubin increasing well before uh, somebody's symptomatic or before you actually visually see it with an individual? Um, and so we did a similar clinical study for patients that were already diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer to basically see from their scleral picture, could we regress to the uh, bilirubin? And it turns out that you actually can, like a blood draw. 
Um, another area of exploration we focused on was looking at the camera and flash for hemoglobin. So looking at, if you put your finger over the camera and flash, um, there's already a ton of apps out there on the app store that can give you your heart rate. Right? There's a PPG monitors that can do that. But what we wanted to look at was could we actually do some more advanced analysis of that? So could we do a hemochrome analysis through that same source where light is, uh, profuse, uh, light is shined on the finger, it's profusing through the finger, and you basically are, are looking at what's happening on the other side uh, through the camera. Um, the idea here was that if you look at the spectrum for plasma and hemoglobin, it actually kind of works out. Uh, if you have a broad white uh, LED, which is already on these phones, um, you actually are kind of roughly in the right spot there. Um, and so the way this actually works is that we shine light through the finger and we actually look at the absorption of uh, those two frequencies of light, both for the hemoglobin and plasma, and we do a ratio to figure out how much hemoglobin is in there. Um, to counteract uh, um, skin tone, what we do is we only look at when the heart is beating. So what happens is when the heart beats, you have the cardiac volume getting to the fingertip. So we're already tracking the heart rate and the pulse. Um, and so when we know when the volume changed when the heart is beating, we know that that differential in hemoglobin uh, or, or, or at least volume was because of the heartbeat and not the skin tone color. So we can actually be, do, do this in a completely skin tone agnostic way because we know when the heart's beating, the, 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 uh, the amount of volume of blood is changing there at the fingertip. And so that's how we do it is the hemochrome analysis basically does it from the, from the, uh, the, the heartbeat itself. Um, so we did a clinical style. We actually got a study where we compared this to uh, uh, the Mossimo device called the Pronto, which is a non-invasive clip-on hemoglobin monitor um, correlated to a, 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 a CBC or just a blood draw. And then in this large clinical trial, uh, it showed that we were just as good as the Pronto device, but in this case, it was a phone app that was doing it. Um, so one of the things that we're doing um, with the Ministry of Health in Peru is uh, Peru is actually um, looking at screening tools for anemia. So they have this big uh, pandemic where a lot, ton of kids are, significant portion of the population, more than half the population are anemic. So they, they're looking for a, a case finding tool where they can quickly, in the jungles of Peru, try to identify these cases so that they can get the resources there. Um, so this is actually uh, from a deployment on the bottom right is we have parents and kids lined up where they're actually going through and screening them in large volumes just through phone apps. Uh, here's an example of a, a kid be, uh, being screened with the with HEMA app in this case. So you can imagine using these tools as case finding tools and then coming up with a, a secondary screening mechanism to be able to uh, divert resources in those places. So this is just kind of one example of the, uh, of the deployment that we've been uh, doing in the past. So one of the things that I've been particularly working on is regulatory. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a kind of an interesting area because if you think about the regulatory guidance for software as a medical device, this is kind of squarely in that space. You have a commodity piece of hardware that we're not touching. We're not doing anything to the hardware itself, but what we're doing is building algorithms and software on top of that. So how do you regulate uh, software as a medical device when you have this kind of a, a system in place? So we've looked at a number of different things and worked closely with the FDA to figure out, well, how do you clear some of these things? And luckily, we do have predicate devices for the hemoglobin globin monitor for bilirubin and those kinds of things. But for regulating something like that, it's actually pretty tough because you have different phones, different standards. You know, what happens when you put your finger over the camera and flash, it gets all smudged up. What happens if this phone comes out of a pocket or a purse and there's lint on the, uh, on the microphone? So we've come up with algorithms of, of that basically detect the quality of the phone and it can actually disable the app, for example. So there's a lot of interesting challenges that we're actually working on from a computer science standpoint to know that the phone is actually safe enough to even use it as a screening tool. Um, and then looking at testing procedures that you can validate across phones. If I had you know, phone A and phone B, they have the same operating system, but they're two different models, how do I validate from you know, potentially a benchtop analysis where I don't have to clear every single variant of the phones? And so there's ways that we've looked at on how to do that. The other thing is uh, safety and trust. Trust is an important one. So if you, talk, if you think about this, you know, if you talk to patients and users, you know, what, a phone app screening? I mean, the mental model of an app is just kind of bizarre, right? It's the, it's the 99 cent thing or free thing where there's not a lot of value attached to it. And you have a clinical grade diagnostic tool when you have an app attached to it where the value of that tool is like, okay, well, it can't be real or it can't work, right? So you have this mental model that you actually have to uh, work with in terms of just society in general in terms of thinking about how a screening tool and an app could actually be related. Um, the other thing is this whole patient-provider interaction. As we started to do a lot of the work in the pulmonary space, you have a whole bunch of data coming in from PFTs that pulmonologists never had access to. So we're actually building back-end systems that can do triage on this data that can only that can escalate certain cases where they actually need to uh, intervene with a nurse case manager or, 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 uh, or a health assistant. Um, and so in that case, these are, there's new 
technology that we need to layer on top of it because if you're able to get this uh, uh, more continuous sources of data, you have to be able to build a backend system to be able to triage. So, so with that, I'll take questions and looking forward to talking more during the, the panel as well. So thank you. Go ahead. That was really interesting. I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit about how you feel uh, either constrained or non-constrained by the existing technologies that are built into phones. Do you feel as though like that platform exists for you to do most of the measurements that you want to do, or do you, could you imagine like the next time the iPhone 15 comes out, if this existed, it That's would right. allow... No, that's a great question. Um, we are certainly constrained. In fact, a lot of times we're actually not constrained by the hardware. A lot of times we're constrained by the APIs. Uh, you know, when you try to take a picture uh, of something, uh, the 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 um, the the uh, the camera system that's there that gives you a picture back is optimized to give you the best vibrant picture for photography. Right? Um, it's definitely not designed to give you a hemoglobin value. And so, a lot of times we actually. Uh, to date, we're actually constrained by what the software gives you back. So being able to kind of uh, open that up a little bit is actually the first enabler. Um, but then the second level is, yes, I think there are, and, and, and the way I see the phone industry heading, I think some of these new sensors are actually going to open up a lot more things. If you think about, you know, hyperspectral imaging, the, the ability to arbitrarily image something from a wider um, uh, uh, for bandwidth standpoint, you can do a lot more things. You can actually image at the subcutaneous level all the way down, right? There, there's these new things that I think are coming out that could enable that. Uh, it is this kind of constant tension, though, right? You know, putting a piece of sensor in there that enables a healthcare use case, is it a viable option for a phone, which is general purpose? So I think there could be this hybrid approach where you might imagine a phone with its general capabilities for general wellness and health, but then you can imagine cases that are designed to give you more specific um, uh, uh, sensor data for people that are at risk and those kinds of things. Things. But that's a good question. Uh, interestingly, to date, it's actually been a software constraint, not a hardware constraint. Just to follow up on yeah. that question, so currently what platforms is it adapted for, the test that you showed us? Yeah, so um, we actually operate on both iOS and Android platforms. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great talk, Great, thank uh, you. Thank you so much.